welcome back to Show and Tell, episode number four. If you are new to this series, I, Matt the Butcher, collaborate with serious at-home hobbyists and professionals and have them show us their dry cured meat chamber. They will run us through their chamber or salumi rooms, how they set it up, how they control temperature and humidity, and give us a rundown on the products they have dry aging inside. Guys, make sure you watch the other episodes so you see how all the other guys do it. And please help the channel out by liking, subscribing, and sharing this video with friends that might like it. Okay, we are on a roll with episode number four, hot off the press. Our next guest's name is Andrew Kim, and he lives all the way across the world in South Korea. He found his passion for curing meats by helping a family member who owned a meat business. The idea was, how can they add more value to the program? Let me give you a hint. Cured meats. Andrew became obsessed after the initial idea. Reading every book and blog post, he got to work, creating incredible charcuterie, both in a professional and at-home environment. Today, we are gonna take a look at where all the experiments begin in the comfort of his own home. Let's all pay close attention while Andrew walks us through his awesome at-home cured meat chamber. Andrew, take it away. Hi everyone, this is Andrew Older from South Korea. So I've been making charcuterie items for about four to five years now, both as a hobbyist and also in more professional settings. And our good friend Matt the Butcher has invited me to participate in his show and tell series. So I'd like to show you guys what kind of setting I have going on in all the way in Korea at my family home right here. So the thing is, Korea has a pretty abysmal climate for making charcuterie items. During summertime, it gets way too hot, way too humid. The humidity would peak up to about 95, 100% pretty often. And wintertime, it's just too cold and too bone dry. When I was stationed in the military near the 38th parallel, I would see the thermometer go down to as low as negative 30 degrees Celsius, which is just a no. So what I did was I turned in one of those very standard beverage alcohol fridge into, from all of the restaurants and bars here in Korea into a curing chamber. So I like to show you how that's looking right now. So let's get to it. So this is a typical beverage fridge I was talking about. I've seen something similar back in the States as well pretty often when I worked in different restaurants and bars. I got this big boy secondhand for about 130 US dollars. As for temperature control, well, I just asked the boys to hook me up with this fridge to change the settings to have it set to 12 degrees Celsius. And I don't need to do anything for temp control. Just turn the fridge on and it's done. As for humidity control, I have our beloved Inkbird humidity controller right here. And the probe is placed right in the chamber. If the humidity is too low, well this humidifier here will turn on. And if the humidity is too high, this dehumidifier, hiding in the back here, will turn on. So pretty straightforward system. However, despite of whatever humidity I set my Inkbird controller to, the actual humidity is never spot on. So I use one of those sensor push type real-time temp humidity readers. So this gives me the reading of average temp and humidity in my chamber in real time, right on my phone. So I will see what the actual average humidity is and will change my Inkbird setting here accordingly. For example, I might have set my ink burn to 80% relative humidity, but this bad boy will tell me that, uh, no. The actual relative humidity is at 70%, which is a bit too low for my taste. Then I will adjust my ink burn humidity setting accordingly by setting it higher, or vice versa. Since I got this setup going on, I haven't had a single humidity related problem in my chamber, so I highly, highly recommend. Also, never forget to calibrate your humidity readers once in a while. I do it about every three months or so. As for airflow control, I do understand at different stages of drying, you need different level of airflow. 
but I've been fine with just having this natural airflow you get from just letting the fridge run. I haven't had any serious case hardening issues or have things go stale or too funky. So pretty much all I'm worried about with this chamber is humidity, since the rest are pretty much taken care of on its own. The things I like about this setting are well how relatively cheap it is to set this up. The whole entire setting cost me about 300 US dollars. If you get a party size gourmet charcuterie platter at a Salamaria, it probably can cost up to that much. But instead, I have this entire chamber. Nice. Plus, this is very delightful to look at. Also, that's why I wrote all these item names and dates and wait on here. It's practical and I think it's cute. However, this also brings me to what I don't like about this setting. Because the fridge door is a see-through, light will hit my products directly. And as you know, for dry cure products, or meats in general, direct light exposure is a no-no, since it can lead to fat oxidation. I do use ascorbic acid, which works as antioxidant in my products, but I don't want to take any chances, so I have to keep this chamber in a pretty dark room in my family home. So I guess I can tape this entire door up with something that doesn't let any light through, but I didn't want to do that. Also, from running different chambers for several years, I learned that humidifiers and dehumidifiers, they don't last forever. They sometimes break. So with wires, I kind of just have this going on right here. Uh, not ideal. I've seen other people drilling holes on side of their chamber and having wires run through it and patching it up with silicon or something. But that would make replacing any broken items such a pain in the butt. So here we are. I'm thinking about cutting out a small patch of rubber here at some point, but I haven't gotten to it yet. So this is about how much product I can fit in my chamber. I think it's the best to just show what I have here so you can kind of estimate how much it can fit in. As for what items I have going on in here, this whole entire row from back, front to back, we got some good old Genoa salami going. Mostly pork, but a little bit of beef in it as well. This entire row is regular saucissons, both in second rosette. This whole entire row is truffle saucissons. My brother gifted me this truffle salt he got from Italy, and I didn't know what to do with it, so I just made salumi with it. Nice. I hope these turn out great. Then this whole entire row we got, Pukpunja rosemary salami. Pokpunja is traditional Korean mountain berries and I use Pokpunja wine and rosemary, juniper berries to make these. I liked how these turned out last time so I just made some tiny adjustments to it and decided to have another go at it. Then we got Panchara Arotolada. I rolled up a couple weeks ago, gave them a decent beating with my bare fist. Like it owes me money. Good times. Then we got lamb salami, almost ready to be harvested. And we got tons of copa and American deli ham style capicolo, dry cured. Easily my favorite products. I sometimes get amazed how great these come out. And I got some lonzo, classic lonzo, and lomo embuchado going. My first attempt on lomo embuchado, so wish me luck. So this was my chamber. Hope you guys enjoyed listening to me being such a fanboy of my own chamber, like the charcuterie nerd I am. And thank you so much for watching. And also, thank you, Matt, so much for inviting me to participate in such a great series. And just like MTV Cribs, I think it's time for me to kick you guys all out. So, wish you guys all the best. Hope to see you guys around. And, well, bye! Wow. What a seriously clean and well thought out setup. The clear glass aesthetic is absolutely gorgeous, especially when that chamber is packed out like that. Also writing all the notes, times, and dates, and having it right there on the glass, keeping your data right in front of you. I mean, that is a really good idea. I think I am going to adopt that. As you guys have seen in the past videos, I also have a dry cured meat chamber that I do out of a wine fridge with a glass front as well. Also the variety of products that Andrew has in that chamber right now is mind blowing.
very cool. And I know it takes a lot of time to do all those individual recipes. So let's take a look at some of the products that just got done drying. For instance, this rolled pancetta is gorgeous. Look at the red, beautiful color on that. And that fat to meat ratio is singing to me. Another one is the saucy on sec, which is like a beautiful little French style cured salami. It's got beautiful red color in there, no case hardening whatsoever. And that thin white layer of mold is just going to be a flavor explosion. I am literally salivating. And lastly, this crazy beautiful charcuterie board that he made for his family and friends all by hand. He made every single one of these meat preparations. How cool is that? Dang, I wish Andrew lived in my neighborhood. Or maybe I'll be on a flight to South Korea very soon. Guys, if you want to contact Andrew with questions or comments or anything like that, all his contact information is going to be in the video description below. Thank you so much for tuning in to Show and Tell episode number four. And if you haven't seen the other Show and Tell episodes, I'll make a playlist linked probably up here and in the video description below so you can watch all the past episodes. And don't forget to like and subscribe and please hit that notification button so you stay up on the most recently uploaded videos. Guys, it's all for the love of meat. Matt the Butcher, 